The Bible explains that the Lord is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. He's worthy of worship, and today we are in yet another worship psalm. We are to worship the Lord, and in this psalm, the psalmist is worshiping the Lord and, and, and meaning to lead us to worship the Lord as well. And one of the things we've seen in our study we've been trying to focus on is a connection between uh, a great Lord and our worship of the Lord, right? And, and, and rightly done, there is a proper grasping of his greatness. You know, I see someone great. I, I see someone worthy, uh, worth celebrating, and that explains my celebrating. Does that make sense? As opposed to we just come in and, you know, it's time for singing, so everyone sing. You know, sing in a praising sort of a way. And there's no real praise there uh, sometimes. There, that, can, that can be the challenge, right? Because it's, it's just singing. It's just everybody knows to sing, right? But, but it, it isn't exactly flowing from I grasp how great the Lord is. And because I grasp how great he is, it leads me to want to just sing, right? Or to praise him. Right, but that's the way it's supposed to work. So, so honestly then, uh, true worship really has to begin with the Lord, doesn't it? And then if your heart is not yet ready to worship, don't start with just some upbeat music. right? Because then upbeat music explains your singing. Just upbeat music always does it for me, somebody might say. And we're like, no. <laughs> well, okay, I appreciate you telling me how you work. But the Lord wants you to work. Not by the upbeat music gets you ready to, to sing, but uh, the thoughts of the glory of the Lord warm your heart to him, give you reason to be so thankful that he is your God and you are his. And those thoughts, you know, b begin to affect you in a way that you're like, I'm just, I'm just so happy that the Lord cares for me. I'm, I'm so happy that he has steadfast love for me. I'm so, I'm so happy that he is, yes, righteous, but he's also so gracious because I know I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm just thinking about my sin right now, and it, it has me, you know, discouraged, and yet uh, in Christ those sins are forgiven. And, and though I fail, he's always faithful, right? And so, so worship is supposed to work like that. And so the best way to get your heart ready to worship is to think about Jesus more. To think about the glory of the Lord more. We were just talking about these books for Advent. Like, you want to worship Jesus well on Christmas Day? Think about him through the month of December. You want to think about Jesus, worship Jesus on a Sunday morning? Read about him on Saturday night. Think about him throughout the week before. Right? But it's the thoughts. It's a reflection. It's a meditation on the greatness of the Great One that the Lord uses to put our hearts in the right place to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And so today we are going to follow the psalmist's charge to worship the Lord. But we're also going to see what the psalmist does. He meditates on some great things about the great God. Now there's two main areas of focus. The psalmist, has, he, he, there's an introduction and there's a conclusion. But, but in the middle, he... he thinks on two large aspects of who the Lord is. The Lord is the creator, right? He, he made everything. He sustains everything. He's working out his purposes in the creation. So that's one area of creation. But secondly is just how blessed are we to be God's people? God is great. And if you are the people of the great God, how blessed is that? And again, by faith, we are God's people, aren't we? And so uh, we can reflect on how great it would be to be God's people, then reflect on we are God's people by faith in Christ. And now we know we're blessed. And we, and we don't say, well, I'm blessed, look at my bank account. No, I'm blessed because I am God's and God is mine. And meditating on that uh, in, in, in uh, service to, okay, now the thoughts of these, worship makes total sense. Right, God, the God of the universe is my God. He's my father. I'm adopted as his by faith. I'm a child of God. So the first <clears throat> section, first three verses, is that introduction I spoke about. It's a, it's a call to praise. 
verses 1 through 3, shout for joy to the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. So there's a shout. There's a call. Uh, it's just, you know, stirring us up. Hey, hey, you, all of you, shout to the Lord. Worship the Lord. And again, it's kind of like we, we saw last time in Psalm 100. There's like a king idea here. Like, like remember you have a king? Uh, you, you should worship that king. Right, and so we're reminded of perhaps Numbers 23, 21. The Lord their God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them, right? They're so excited that their king is among them that they shout. And again, that should be a way that we ought to be operating. We ought to be operating. We, the king of kings, the Lord of lords is our Lord. Uh, he's even called us here to gather, here to worship him today, and that should affect us, and that should lead us uh, to worship and praise. He says, praise befits the upright. It just, it's proper, <laughs> Uh, upright people, pe- pe- people who, who, who know who their God is and mean to live for their God. I mean, it's appropriate. It's, 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 it's just the appropriate thing that goes with such people that they would praise their Lord, right? It's actually kind of unfitting that we say, yes, we're his. Well, do you worship him? Not really, right? And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't fit, right? No, actually what fits the righteous <laughs> is that they know their Lord and they worship him. And so there's just this call here. It's totally right that you, knowing uh, your great king, would uh, magnify your great king. And so you, you give thanks to him with a lyre, with skillfulness. And so there's a sense in which we ought to put some, uh, you know, we ought not to just haphazardly worship. We should uh, use some well-crafted songs, you know, th- 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 songs that are thoughtfully uh, put together, th- th- you know, work on, uh, as it were, skillfully. Uh, worshiping the Lord, which doesn't mean you have to become a professional singer or anything like that, but it does mean, uh, you know, we're thankful for uh, generations of uh, men and women who have written hymns to help us express uh, the glories of the Lord, right? Or even just the psalmists themselves who express uh, praise to the Lord in skillful ways. Uh, it, it's right that thought and dedication go into that uh, because the Lord is worth it. And so uh, we just have a big uh, call to praise here in, this, in the beginning, right? It's a call to worship. The, the, it says, sing a new song, which is probably uh, a reference of how you'd sing if you'd, you, if you'd won in uh, battle. You'd, you might sing a new song. But it might also mean uh, something like <clears throat> you're grasping, and this is, I think, what we're up to in this uh, song, by the way. You're grasping afresh or, right, or, or just for the first time, perhaps, some aspect about the Lord, <laughs> and it leads you to, to worship him, right? And, and that's what we want. I think that's the, a large part of the Christian life is we do know the Lord, and yet we don't know all that we need to know about the Lord. And it's not about not passing a test. It's just about aren't we interested in knowing uh, the great one, uh, our great Lord, even more. And as we do, doesn't that lead us to worship him in, in as it were, with some freshness, uh, with some newness, uh, as we, you know, I, I'd heard this before, and today, uh, by God's help, I really begin to appreciate uh, just how wonderful it is, you might say, that the Lord is my Father, or the Lord is, uh, you know, whatever truth. And it, and it leads us to sort of like a fresh worship of Him, uh, because it's, it's, not, it's the same Lord, uh, but it's some aspect about Him that you hadn't fully appreciated, and by God's help, you now appreciate and understand more, you grasp it in a greater way, and you sing uh, from, you know, but you can see a connection. The greatness of the Lord, now rightly understood, explains my singing today. And so uh, that's the introduction. The introduction, again, is a call to praise. And then, as I said before, there's two main areas. And the next section of eight verses is praising the Creator, right? And, and, and uh, what's going on here, there's a, there's a fair bit of the Lord made everything and keeps everything going. That's how the world works, right? The Lord did not just set everything up and just let it go on its own. No, he created it and he keeps it going, right? And then also there is a bit in this section that says, and he, did, he didn't say, I don't have a plan for this world. He says, I do have a plan, okay? So, so it'd be one thing if the Lord just said, you know, he, he made the world and somebody said, well, what, what do you have in mind? He's like, I don't know, let's just see what happens. But that isn't what he did. He didn't say, I don't know, let's just see what happens. No, he has his purposes and he's working out his purposes, right? And so th- that's, that's what this section is about. A, a Lord who makes and sustains everything and has a purpose and is doing uh, the work that he uh, created the world uh, for, right? He's doing that work and working out his, his will. So uh, I'm going to break this up into two, two sections of four verses. The first, uh, the verses four through seven, 
uh, in all that he says and all that he does. So every word and in every action, right? He is righteous and he is loving, verses 4 through 7. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of, his, of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. So again, his words, so whatever he says and then whatever he does, in both areas, right, he is righteous and faithful. That is righteous. He'll, always, he'll never do something that will ashamed us. Whatever, I'm kind of ashamed that God did that. that that'll never happen, right? I mean, I hope to live that way as a father, but maybe sometimes I do. Maybe sometimes I'm a failure. Like we're, sometimes we're just not what we want to be, right? But the Lord is always righteous. He's always faithful. He'll never let his people down. He'll never make us ashamed. There'll never be a reason to be ashamed of the Lord, right? And so he's always going to do something that we're like, that's my Lord, <laughs> Right? That's my God. He is ruling. And he's, oh, he's acting right. When he did that, he was righteous. That was the right thing to do. Right? And so, and he's faithful, which just means honestly, uh, well, I mean, we know uh, by faith we're in a relationship with him. Right? He is our God. We are his people. Uh, now, he wants us to be faithful to him, and we sometimes fail. But what we can always count on is he's going to be faithful to us. He's going to do right by us. He's going to do what is uh, for his glory, for our eternal good. And so he is perfect in his character. And, uh, and he is toward us. He's, he didn't have to uh, uh, call us to be his own. But voluntarily he did uh, choose us and he has saved us. And we are his. And now he has made a commitment uh, to be faithful to us all the way to the end. It says that he loves righteousness. Uh, he, he's, he's, he doesn't rejoice in anything sinful whatsoever. And especially then, um, he is steadfast. And I, I love this part about the Lord because this, the steadfastness of the Lord uh, always brings to mind not only his goodness, but it, it assumes that you and I sin. It assumes you and I are not faithful sometimes, right? We want to be faithful. We got out of bed, we thought, today we're going to be faithful, right? And then, but at some, some points along the way, right? And tomorrow will probably be the same way. And so we just, we, in a sense, we get used to it. We don't, we don't want to ever give in to that, to, to give ourselves over to sin. But, but, but we are loved despite the fact that we are not perfect like the Lord, right? And, and so many people think, well, to be a Christian is to, like, never make a mistake, to always get it right. I mean, God gets everything right. Why can't I do everything right? And then when they don't, they're kicking themselves. And again, I, there's, there's something to that. Like, I don't want you to say, yeah, I sinned and no big deal, right? But I, but I do want to say uh, there's a sense in which we do expect it, right? And that the Lord who said, I love you, says, I'm going to keep loving you. And you didn't get, you didn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't save you one day, and three weeks later, he's like, you did that, forget it, I'm done with you. He doesn't do that. The steadfast love reminds us that though we sin, he loves us still. Right? That's the, that's the way that steadfast love is such a precious truth to us, because it, it gives us reason to say, the Lord does know about your sin. He really does. We don't have to hide it from him. There's a sense we could, I guess we should be embarrassed about it, right? I mean, we're not shamelessly sinning. We should be embarrassed about it, but there's a sense in which we, just, we can just confess it. We could just go to him again, Lord, again, I failed. Lord, I need your help. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness for the, my sins in Christ, and thank you that you love me still. I don't understand it. I don't know how you can. You're always faithful. I'm not as faithful as I want to be at all, and Lord, you love me still, and, and I, <laughs> you know, I, I love you so much <laughs> that I don't have to pretend to be perfect. Uh, I can just be who I am, uh, you know, but, but I, but I want to be more godly. I want to I be yours, and yet, uh, though I sin, you love me still. And so I love this truth about the steadfast love of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord is part of his glory. Uh, again, other truths about this are his grace and his mercy. And when, when God says, hey, I'm good, in Exodus 33, 18 and 19, Moses said, show me your glory. He says, I'll make my goodness pass before you. And the aspects of the goodness of the Lord that were passed in front of Moses was gracious to whom I will be gracious, 
have mercy on whom I'll show mercy. Which just means we need grace and we need mercy. And it's, yes, the Lord is perfectly righteous, but, but part of his goodness is that he knows our sin and somehow he loves us still. And so there's that mercy and grace that we keep coming back to again. Not, not, again, not to use it as an excuse to live wickedly, right? But, but as those who love the Lord and honestly want to honor him in the way that we live, there's still failures, there's still sin, and, and we will not sin in a way, uh, having been redeemed by Christ, will not sin in a way that he stops loving us. It, he'll, his love will just stick to us. Well, the Lord has, as we said, creating and sustaining power. Uh, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And we've, we've talked about this pretty recently, so we won't go into too much depth. But, I mean, just by words, he made everything. It's a reference to Genesis 1. Uh, he said, let there be light. Right? He didn't gather up uh, light ingredients and create the light. <laughs> uh, he, he just said. He, he literally just says, let there be light. And there it is. So by words, he can make stuff. And so, um, but, but there's, there's also, there's a sense in this passage, what they're trying to do is, and I think this is for the whole passage, by the way, to build up in our minds the greatness of God, right? Uh, I, I'll, I'll talk later about the ways that some people try to sort of make God not as great as the Bible says he is. I don't think that helps anybody, right? We, we, there's, there'll be no sense in which you can build up God greater than he is. Uh, our big problem is, uh, we've been told he's great, and we think he's like here, <laughs> you know. And, and, but he's far greater than we grasp, right? And so one of the things going on in this text is he's t- to build up, right, so that, so that your estimation of God comes closer to the greatness of what he really is. Does that make sense? So again, there's no sense in which he's, that we would build him up to be greater than he is. No, he is great. He's, he's infinitely great. Right? And so here we are thinking about has, how great he is. And he says, you know, he gathers the water. And if you've just ever gone to the ocean, <laughs> you know, and, and imagine. Uh, so the Bible pictures the Lord like as in the hollow of his hand. Like that's the, the ocean fits here. Right? And, and the picture is to help you think. <laughs> if you've ever been to the ocean, uh, I could drown out there. Uh, when the waves come, uh, they, they would totally cr- crush me and crash upon me and suck me under. And I'd be down there and nobody would ever find me if you ever, like, you know, I hope I'm not creating any bad dreams for anybody. But that's, it's immense, right? It's well beyond us. And so the picture of, of the waters being in the palm of his hands says, okay, you're, you are right to be afraid. <laughs> But, but your God holds that like just, just, like just right here. He, he's so in control. That's the point, right? He has so much immense power that what could wreck you and all of us at once is totally controllable under the immense power and sovereignty of your God. Right? And so uh, we, we're, rem- we're reminded, Isaiah speaks about it similarly, Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, right? And marked off the heavens with a span. He's like, how far is that? That's the distance, right? He's just, he's just immense. He can, we, we're going light years and light years. And he's like, I feel like it's like maybe that, you know, it's just not very far. You know, because he's just immense. It's speaking about his ability uh, to uh, empower, uh, control all things. Enclosing the dust of the earth in a measure and weighing the mountains in scales. Right? Mountains that would take us days and weeks and a lot of assistance to uh, summit, and he can just weigh it in the scales, right? Um, and, and again, the Lord then controls and restrains all things. And again, I think that's the other part of it. It's not just his immensity. He's so big, he's bigger than mountains. That's true. But also, for us, again, uh, the, the seas can be quite scary, and... Even something, imagine, you know, a big tsunami coming. How would we control that? We, we wouldn't. We would run. That's how we would control that situation, without control and with panic, right? And so, but the Lord, he, he, that's not how he handles it, right? He, he controls all things, Proverbs 8, 29. When he assigned to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundation of the earth. So it speaks about the, the water will only go as far as the Lord says the water will go. That's, that's how he works. It's different than us. 
right? And so, uh, there's, so we're, we're building up not just power, but also uh, immense control then. And you were in a world, uh, I'm sure you've encountered this uh, many times even this week, with things beyond you that you cannot control, right? And, and you, you've tried everything you know to try to control, and you just cannot control that. And the Lord is saying, you know, I never run into that trouble. I, I, ne- I never have that problem. I, I, know, I know you have that problem. I actually created you to have those problems. <laughs> I created you to have those problems so that you would trust in me. Now, silly one, I see you trusting in you. And, and as long as you trust in you, you should fear. Because I put fearful things in this world to make the people who trust in themselves fearful. And yet I am the ruler of this world so that all the creatures who look to me and trust in me can live in a fearful world with no fear, for I am their God. And so the Lord, again, means for you to not only see that he's immense, but see how stupid it would be to rely on your puny power and how perfectly reasonable it would be to to rest in his superior power. Right? So we're led here to trust in our Lord, to feel our need of him and our weakness and our sin. In the next section on creation, verses 8 through 11, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. So two words there in the early part there, fear and awe. Uh, you should, we just talked about his power. Uh, you should live in right reverence of this God. Right? It, it's a reverence. It's, a, it's, a, it's the respect that is owed to greatness. Now, if you don't yet see that God is great, I can see why you don't respect him. <laughs> but the, the problem is not that he's not great. You have... You, you, you need to do yourself a service by thinking on the greatness of the Lord, coming to terms with that, and now responding properly, which is awe, worship, uh, being amazed. Uh, but the Lord himself is great. And again, he's putting his greatness on display. It's here in the Word. And again, we're, we're doing a Word exercise here, just spending time thinking on his attributes in order to uh, rightly grasp how great he is. Right? And... Um, so, it, again, we're, we're struck, as it were, by his greatness. We're in awe of him. He is, uh, again, great in creation. He spoke everything into existence. Uh, he commands things, right? That's what this passage says. He spoke, it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Right? So, so not, nothing's going to tumble unless the Lord wants it to tumble. If he wants it to stand, it'll stand. That's the Lord's power. The council, he's, it says here, the councils of the nations, he brings them to nothing. So, and, and then what's the point there? Well, the, the point there is, uh, this is the direction we need to head. I think a lot of people think, yeah, the Lord handles the big stuff. I mean, if a whole nation wants to do something, the Lord can stop it. And everybody says, amen, that's right. The nation wants to, right? So let's talk about that a minute. I'm glad for that. He can do anything. He he, he's, and he's doing what he wills. Daniel 4, 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are c- accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. So if he wants to do it, nobody can stop him, right? And they won't say to him, what have you done? Like, like you don't have the right. They can't do that, right? They, they wouldn't, I mean, they might in stupidity, but they can't, they, they don't have a claim against him like he's done something wrong. He is always right. And again, if we all teamed up, let, let's all take on God together. We would get nowhere. But let's say we got all, all, of, all, of, all of America to team up against the Lord. How, how would we fare? Terribly, right? Let's go, we got the whole world. So, so you, there's no group of humans that you can gather together with all of our collective firepower and say, now we're ready to take on the Lord. The Lord would just have no trouble at all, right? And so, so we're, we're taught here again immense power, but also f- the futility 
of living in rebellion against him, but then uh, how, how blessed it is to live under the protection of that much power, right? And so, again, the Lord does what he wants to do. That's, that's the Bible's other lesson. I think I, I want to move on in your mind now from he's powerful to, remember how he said he made the world and he's doing something? So, he, again, he's not doing nothing. He's doing something, <laughs> right? So, uh, he does according to his will, right? None can stay his, well, we, if we all said we're going to keep him from doing that. Like, we couldn't do it. We couldn't stop him. Even if we all said, we'll stop him. We just couldn't do it. Right? Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 25. Who frustrates the signs of liars, makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish. Makes, makes the so-called wise people among us look, look like fools. Right? Who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers... Who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins. Now, again, we're used to that. If you just, just remember the Old Testament, the Lord said, if the Lord said, my people are going to win, they won. And if, if somebody said, well, well, I mean, look how many they have, and look how many, a few you have, he would go, this is no problem. As a matter of fact, I might, I might thin up my army like I did with Gideon. Right? I, 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 might make it, I might make the odds even worse in my favor, and then win. So, so the Lord again and again basically says, if I want my people there, they'll be there. If I actually I don't want my people there, they're not staying there. So there's this real sense in which there is a powerful God who's always acting righteously. And the best thing you can do is just get on his team. And if you ever find yourself not on his team, what you ought to do right then is confess your sin and get on his team again. Right? Because, because it's just ridiculous to, to think. I mean, you're thinking like the world if you think it's going to work out. But we know the Lord, and we know not just his power, but also his kindness, right? We keep coming back to this. I don't, I don't want to scare you on to God's team. I mean, there's enough scary to do that. I just want to also show you how gentle and kind and gracious and merciful he is, as it were, to woo you on to his team. Uh, this, his team's so much better uh, than the cutthroat world that we live in. The only thing you have to give up, the main thing you have to give up is that you want to be king. And the Lord will have none of that. He, he's the king. So, so I get it. I get the challenge. But just realize how foolish that is. There's a king of kings, and you want to be the king of you. And he's saying he's the king of you. And who do you think is going to win on the last day? Well, the Lord has made it clear. So I get, I get that we don't want to give up being king. And yet... The Lord demands it, and he will have it. But in his kindness, he's made a way of escape for our rebellion in Christ. Well, we have the Lord, again, talking about what the Lord did. I, I stopped there in the middle of Isaiah 44, picking up in verse 27. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. All right, so the dry part, you know, he made the Red Sea dry. He can take entire seas and make it dry if he wants to. He can look at, a, he can look at a, 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 the Babylonian king Cyrus, and he says, I'm going to make you do my service. Like, what we're used to, again, if you, read the, if you read the Bible very closely, if you don't read it very closely, you think, well, God gets his people to do what he wants them to do. And sometimes, and that's, by the way, true, he also takes people that aren't his people and gets them to do what he wants them to do. <laughs> like, I want, I, I want my place rebuilt, right? And, he's, and he uses a Babylon, a, a, an unbelieving king, to get his work done. And the Lord, the Lord's, so what we have here is a very powerful God who is getting things done through whatever means he wants to get it done. Always righteous means, mind you, but he's not limited to just using the people who say I'm on t God's team. <laughs> uh, sometimes he's using people who are still in rebellion against him and he's still accomplishing his purposes. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built. And of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. And again, if the Lord says, I'm going to do it, he does it. It gets done. So what we have here is a big God with big plans getting it done. And again, if you are on the wrong side of that, be warned. Right? He's, he's getting things. Now, the, the, again, and what I want to emphasize at this point is how big the Bible says God is. Accomplishing his will, he is righteous and faithful, 
wise in planning. He's, he's accomplishing all his will. And I believe that many today err by beginning with, not with God, but with their own understanding of themselves. And I understand it's a challenge to understand the, 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 how does a sovereign God and responsible people work together. <laughs> but I think the way, if, you know, how can we be responsible if God's as sovereign as, as, as some people say it is? And at this point, I just want to say, well, I'm just trying to read the Bible, <laughs> uh, how, how, how powerful is God. But if you start with man and you say, okay, let's just start with how I like to think about people. I like to think that we mess things up. I like to think that we, and all these things. And so they, they build up man and they've given man about this much or maybe they've given a man this much. And all this left over for God is just this little bit on the edge there. And they're like, that's how it works. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, don't start with your own understanding about how powerful you think a man is. And then give God the leftovers. Start with the Bible Start with God, listen to God tell you about how he accomplishes his will and no one can thwart his plans. And then whatever's left over for man, you can say that's what we've got left over. And then if, you're, and if somebody wants to argue with, well, how do you reconcile? Just say, I'm just trusting the Lord on these. And we can have conversations about how we reconcile it. I, I think there's lots of, of progress we can make on that. But let your impulse be, because uh, I just think, I, I feel for a lot of people, their description of how powerful God is or isn't uh, isn't making good sense of these verses we're talking about, and there's so many more that talk about God who nobody can thwart his plans. He, he accomplishes his will. And, 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 and this is a practical matter, because if in your mind people are really powerful, because you, you started with that, the, the, you've built up man with so much power that to trust the God that you've only given this much to, you, there's not much to trust. But if he's the God of the universe accomplishing his will and nobody can thwart his plan, then there's so much to trust. Do you see what I'm saying? There's, there's so much power. There's so much righteousness. There's so much goodness. There's so much uh, able to defend his own, able to save the righteous when, whenever he wants to. Because he's a big, powerful God. He's not a tiny God. He's not the God that, that the world gave him just a little bit left over. He's, he's the God of everything. And, and you need that sort of understanding of God, not just because it's theologically right, but because you are also supposed to trust him in a world full of trouble. But if the trouble is all the powerful ones in your mind, then, then it feels like little, little help that God's going to help you because you've only given him so much. Now, you're wrong. He's, he's quite powerful. But I think a, a solid theology of God's sovereignty, of God's immense power, of his goodness, of his accomplishing his will, will serve us well uh, when inevitably, since we were made to trust him, we are trusting him because we are overwhelmed. So begin with the Bible, a Bible that reveals a very big God, a very powerful God, believing man, leaving not only you weak, right? When we talk about a big God, it leaves you weak, right? You, you already know that about you. It actually leaves your enemy weak comparatively, right? Because a lot of us are happy to say, I'm weak and God's strong, but that other guy that's my enemy, he, he's actually, he's real strong, <laughs> right? And you're like, no, 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 with a strong God, uh, you and your enemy are weak. Now, your enemy might be relatively stronger than you, and, and yet both of you pale under your father, the Father whose protection you depend upon, the Father who will defend you. Right? He, he will save you. He will provide for you. Right? But we need a big God. And, but, and, and let me get, I just want to get this straight one last time. I'm not preaching a big God because you need one. I'm preaching a big God because he's a big God. <laughs> but I'm also telling you, you need this big God. And we move right into he, our, his people are blessed. Look, we are blessed to have such a God. Right, we just talked about creation. He does everything and he accomplishes his will and all the rest. You, you are, I am blessed to have, th this is my father. Right, just imagine unbelievers in a world that's way too much for them. And they have no one to turn to but themselves. And yet we have a protector. We have a God who has saved us and provides for us and gives us hope in this life and eternal hope.
And so how blessed we are. I need to move quicker on this. The Lord is, uh, we are blessed uh, by his choosing. Verses 12 through 15, I'm going to be brief here. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of all and observes all their deeds. So again, his people are blessed. And this is one of those things the Bible is really clear about. Look, you are blessed to have God. Uh, by, by the way, we're foolish. Uh, we, we have dumb ideas a lot of times. Like sometimes we think, the worst part about it is we think they're great. Uh, but but when, we, when we play them out, they're not as wise as we think they are. Uh, they're not in accord with the wisdom from the Lord. And so they are foolish. And we, you know, in time we figure that out. Uh, and one of the blessings of the Lord is... Uh, he speaks to a world of people who aren't as smart as they think they are, and he tells them wise things like live this way. And if we can get that message earlier on, how much better our life will be. Like, and, and then whatever point we come to terms with that, how, how, how our life turns around. Isaiah 40, verses 8 through 10. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen the offspring of Abraham, my friend, to whom I took from the ends of the earth and called you from the farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So there's an upholding, there's a powerful God taking care of his people. Of course, he chose Israel, we know about that in the Old Testament. Uh, so, uh, and part of the greatness of the Lord, by the way, is... He just looks down. I mean, he, he, he's pictured as seated on his throne, looking down on everything. He sees everything, right? That's part of the greatness of the Lord. And yet, part of the greatness of the Lord is his own choosing. And again, some people don't like the word choosing. I mean, it just keeps showing up in the Bible, and it probably frustrates people. But it's in there, right? It's here in our text, whom he has chosen. And again, I just read about, and we all know this. I mean, this seems to be, should, shouldn't be controversial. He chose Israel. Uh, he chose them to be his own people. Right, he, 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 but our text uh, chose you from the from the uh, ends of the earth, called from the farthest corner. The, 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 the point there seems to be uh, not because you were the the best; you were like way over there in the corner. <laughs> uh, I, I I called you though you didn't deserve it. I made you something special though you were nothing. That's that's the Lord's uh, basic point here, uh, right? And, and He made something great of them. He he, did, he he brought great blessing through them. Brought, brought Christ through them, right? And so the, there's the Lord choosing, and of course He chose Israel. We know that. Uh, but, but he still does that today, doesn't he? Calling his elect. Uh, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Even as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us. Again, chose us, predestined us. Again, words that some people uh, want to run from. And I would just say, well, they're just right there. Uh, he chose us. He predestined us. And so there's a choosing, yes, of Israel. There's a choosing of his own people. And so the Lord here is working out his own will. And he uh, predestines us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. He had, again, the Lord has a purpose and a will. We don't understand it. We don't understand all the insides and outsides of it. But here he is with a plan, with a purpose, and he's accomplishing it. All right? It says not only that he knows your heart, by the way. I mean, we, we, know, we know he knows our hearts, right? I mean, you probably know this. This is how he judges us on the last day, right? So 1 Kings 8, 39 uh, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know. So Lord, look, look down and see, and you know everybody's heart. Give everybody what they, you know, you know their hearts. Give them what they deserve, right? According to all his ways. So, uh, but he also fashions us. He, you know, he makes us what we are. He makes us what, into what he wants us to be by his grace. He is working. He's fashioning hearts. He's not just observing hearts. Yes, he observes hearts. He fashions hearts. So we have a powerful God working out his will. Uh, and, and this passage, again, uh, is helping us um, uh, consider our massive Lord and how blessed we are to be as people. Th this whole section, right, verses um, what, um, 12 through 19, is a section that talks about how blessed we are to be the Lord's people. And the whole section then ends with this conclusion here, wait on the Lord and be glad. Verses 20 through 22, let me read those verses to you. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Look, in a world where people, men and women, look to themselves, the Lord made you to look to him. Right? He, he made you to look to him. 
So wait on the Lord. This passage here is telling us, wait on the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him. So wait on him, right? Wait on his timing. Wait on his will. Don't think his will is taking a long time. Let me come up with my own will. Let me do my own thing. No, no, no. Wait, wait on the Lord. That, that is the challenge, isn't it? Right? We got all kinds of great plans and we wanted it yesterday. And, and the Lord has his plan. He's working it out. He's not on your timetable. He's not even mad. Like he's not, he's not flustered that you're like, hurry up. He's just like, I, I, I'm, do, I'm, doing, I'm acting wisely. I'm acting justly and I'm working out my perfect plan. So he's calling us to wait on him. Right? And also to be glad. Again, not wishing. Well, I mean, here we are in the middle of the Lord's plan. Look how slow this is. I've got a good one. No, no, no. Be glad. Be glad that he isn't working on your dumb plan. Right? Be glad that he has a wiser plan and he's working on that one. Right? So there's a, there's a gladness. I, I get it. There's a bit of patience that needs to be worked into us by the Lord's help. But if you have a strong sense of his superior will and way and that he's accomplishing it, then we can just rest in that, can't we? So again, these, these, I keep wanting to emphasize this. These theological ways of thinking about God are quite practical. Now, your impatience this week would be helped by a stronger theology about God, right? If you, if you knew the Lord better, you would get less frustrated in your own life. And maybe you know him, but you forget it. And so, it, so, so instead of learning brand new what the Lord's like, meditate on what he's like, right? But, but, uh, but our frustrations uh, in our lives with, with either what's, what we're doing that aren't going as well, we want to do, or what's happening with somebody else, you know, are going to be helped a lot by recognizing that the Lord is working out his perfect will in his life. A strong sovereignty of God doctrine in your life will help you live a contented life. And so may the Lord help apply good theology to the practical uh, day-to-day frustrations that, and angers even that we deal with. Well, again, hope in him, right? Delight in the plan that he has for, his, for your life. Trust him. Um, and again, those who, those who can live this way, if you can live a life that, that is happy that he's in charge and trusts him, uh, that's a blessed life, right? That, that's just an easy, e- easy recipe, <laughs> right? And instead, I don't feel so blessed because I'm not really trusting him. Uh, I, I got other things in mind. <laughs> I'm not really delighting in him. I wish it was different, right? You don't feel very blessed. And again, we're not talking about dollars and cents. We're just, we're just talking about, do, do you know joy in your present circumstance? That's the blessed life, right? But I tr- I'm trusting the Lord. He's working on something really great here. I depend on him. Okay. Well, the, the Lord then um, has, has shown uh, his provision for us. We've talked about Christ many times, but I just want to emphasize Christ here at the end. Um, We are blessed that we are his because he provided all we need, not just because he's got a good plan, but because in the way that plan was specifically worked out on the cross. The Lord uh, provided for our sin and provided for our forgiveness in Christ. Romans 5, 5, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. By the work of Christ, our sins are forgiven. By the work of Christ in our hearts, the love of Christ has been poured out and changed us and made us into, yes, new creatures, but the sorts of creatures that love to rest and trust and delight in our God who's working out the other parts of our life besides our salvation, (laughs) all all the other details of our life in wise ways. And again, I think uh, the, the way we're best served as we reflect on a great God is, Lord, re- resign me to submission to you. Resign me to your timing. Resign me to your plan. Resign me to your working out of that plan. And I hope the Lord, because I don't know if I'm doing a great job, I hope the Lord is, is impressing on your heart how, how much more blessed your life would be if that mindset pervaded in, in the way that you just engaged in your week next week as compared to how you engaged in your week this past week. And I think the Lord is, is hopefully uh, helping us to see, yes, I would be far more blessed if I loved and was glad uh, that I was living in his world with his plans for his purposes. Uh, Lord, uh, put a joy in my heart for your plans and your purposes this week. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God. 
for a, a reflection on how right it is for us to worship you, but then also helping us to think about so many great reasons and so many great ways that we are helped to praise you. Lord, we've, we've had a, a, a strong emphasis in this text on your power, your will, your wisdom, your purposes. They are above ours. They're better than ours. How you've made us to rejoice, not that our will is done, but that your will is done. Lord God, give us such hearts. Help us to lay down our own personal plans for us and our world that we want everything to go our way. And Lord God, may we just look to you and hope that your plans are accomplished, even as we lay down our own. That we'll rest in your purposes in this world and stop fighting against you. That we would rejoice in you and know joy in our submission to your will rather than fighting against and begrudging that our will isn't accomplished. Lord God, teach us to be blessed as you mean for us to be blessed, as joyfully just being your people, living your way, and getting on board with your purposes in this world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.